Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we're uh, continuing with the series of seminars of the you know, of the physics department, University of Chile, and today we have uh, Professor Harry Westphal, Jr., uh, who is director of the Brazilian Synchrotron Light Laboratory, that is the Synchrotron in, Cam in Campinas, as many many of us know it. Uh, Professor Westphal uh, made his studies in Brazil at the University of State University of Campinas. Then he moved to, to the US to make two postdocs and, at Illinois and Iowa. And then he returned as a theoretician leading the theory group in the uh, Campinas laboratory, in the Singleton laboratory. And then um, he, as he was telling me, he fell in love with the experiment. And uh, finally, he became a scientific director of the lab. And now, since uh, last year, actually, he's the director of the uh, synchrotron facility in, in Brazil. And uh, today, he's going to tell us about this uh, extraordinary facility that we have in Latin America and the new setup that um, uh, is a, a stand, like an upgrade of the lab. So please, Professor Wessel. Thank you very much for, for the invitation. It's, um, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here with you. And um, I hope I can show you some of the things that are available in our lab and the things that we've been developing and that might contribute to your research in the future, or even uh, with, uh, uh, collaborating with us in, in, in developing new instruments or in for your labs. Um, let me first start. Uh, so I will share my screen. Okay, um, you can all see my screen, right? So please feel free to interrupt me at any moment. Uh, I believe this is going to be informal. So um, I will start just by showing you where we are. Well, we are in the National Center for uh, Research in Energy and Materials in Campinas, Sao Paulo. Let me just change my pointer. Uh, Okay, I think this one is better. Uh, this is a campus. Uh, yeah, we are managed by a nonprofit organization under contract with the Brazilian Ministry of Science and Technology and Innovations. And um, for those of you who knew Elena Las, uh, is the lab that gave birth to all this center, is the uh, Brazilian Na uh, Laboratory for Synchrotron Radiation. And uh, we used uh, to, to operate this second generation synchrotron light source. Uh, yeah, yeah, for those who have used LNLS before, uh, our facility, uh, this was the lab they used to, to encounter. Uh, I, I just heard that uh, some of your colleagues used the diffraction beam line. Uh, in fact, this is the one over here. Uh, this lab has been deactivated in 2019. And now we are operating this much bigger facility as a fourth generation synchrotron storage ring. I'll, I will explain what this, this means uh, in, in the, as, as follows. But in the center, we have also other three national laboratories. Uh, the lab for nanosciences and, and uh, is dedicated to uh, research in um, uh, drug development and uh, pathogen biology and cancer and cardiovas uh, cardiovascular biology. Um, uh, Alan Nano, which is the uh, is a national lab for science and uh, nanoscience and nanotechnology, is one of the most advanced uh, electron microscopy parks uh, here in Latin America. So it's also uh, a lab open for uh, for users. It has cryo electron microscopy and uh, uh, also um, other facilities for nanofabrication. Uh, LNBR is the, the most recent lab in the campus is dedicated to the development of microbial platforms for the production of biorenewables on industrial scale. And so they study the biomass and other forms of deconstructing 
uh, polymers and other products to make them become uh, um, say, less sustainable um, chemistry uh, and uh, green chemistry. So these four labs decompose CNPM, where, which is here in Campinas. We have, uh, it's, uh, we have several open facilities. Each one of this lab has have different facilities that are open for users. And uh, we have users from all over the world. So all these connections are people who use our facility and have published and, and have collaborated with the, our lab, our center. And you see from Chile here, two universities, uh, University de, de, de Chile and Universidad de Valo Paso. Um, and also, well, of course, from Brazil, we basically have users and, and collaborators from um, mostly the, all, all, the, all the states in, in the country. And um, so my talk uh, is going to be first, I'm going to explain the evolution of the CDUS project and what is uh, a fourth generation light source and why it is important and why, why this brings us new information about nature. And um, then I'm, I'm going to show some of the scientific programs that we have um, in, the, um, in, in this um, facility and uh, the kind of user support that we can provide and the, the R&D that we did with local industries for the entire project. So um, the Sirius project itself, the news, this new accelerator, uh, was uh, he was an evolution from a project that we had of a third generation light source. And uh, the new technology of, of synchrotron uh, of accelerators that is so-called the multiband acromat technology was proposed for MAX4. It uh, was a lab in Sweden. So, um, and it was built, uh, it was in the process of construction when we decided to make Sidious a fourth generation light source based on the same kind of technology. They are different. And by the same time, uh, the synchrotron near, in Argonne, near Chicago, Illinois was planning and it's, it's actually in the, in the process of construction. Um, this is going to be open in a few years. ESRF upgraded uh, is, uh, is, um, is the synchrotron of the European community. It was also upgraded for fourth generation light source. And Springgate in Japan is also planning an upgrade for the new future. So these are the only three fourth generation synchrotrons in the world. Most synchrotrons are third generation uh, or second generation like our old synchrotron. I will explain later what this, this means in terms of the experiments that you can do. So this is just some uh, timeline of our construction. Um, after this, uh, so I, I said 2000, the end of 2012 was when we officially approved this project. So by 2013, we were working on the, the, the design of this machine. And uh, this was, uh, uh, it was on nature in, in 2013, showing the machines that were using this new technology in the world. So by uh, January 2015 was the groundbreak uh, when we started the construction. What you see just is just the terrain being prepared. So in 2015, we started construction. And by 2018, we had the building constructed. And this is the current stage. We are uh, operating in what we say commissioning mode. So this is the entire building. And uh, I'm going to give a, just a small walkthrough what this, uh, what this big thing is. So when we look inside, what we see, uh, we have the accelerators here inside, I'm going to describe what is accelerated, but essentially the electrons are generated here in the linear accelerator. Their energy is boosted in this internal accelerator. And then the electrons are, the electrons are stored in the, this storage ring. So I have a very simplified animation of electron packages passing in our magnets and creating light that is distributed to this experimental stations. So basically we use electromagnetic radiation from infrareds all the way to the X-ray that are produced by these electrons uh, stored in the, in, at the speed of light uh, in, the, in, in the storage ring. They produce intense radiation of broad spectrum. Then we use this radiation in the stations to analyze different kinds of materials. Um, if you look in detail, uh, what we have, it's, uh, it's, these are packages of electrons uh, uh, with a, a cross section of roughly of order of tens of microns in one direction and microns in the other direction and extended towards millimeters. So these packages, they have basically a picosecond uh, time variation. So it's very fast. Uh, 
and uh, in a frequency range of hundreds of megahertz. So it's basically a continuous light source. It's not pulsed. Each one of these packages has a, of, of the order of 10 to the 9 electrons. So it's basically packages of electron. This is about 1,000 packages running around this circumference of 518 meters. So which takes an electron basically two microseconds to make a full turn at the speed of light. And when we have about a thousand packages, this gives a separation of two nanoseconds. So it gives this 500 megahertz of pulsing of light. It's basically a continuous light source for us. Right? And um, inside this storage ring, what we see, for instance, as I told you, this is the linear accelerator. This is a 150 mega electron volt accelerator. I will show you an animation inside so you can visit in the inside of our accelerator for, for a while. And then in this uh, internal part of the storage ring, we have this booster accelerator and the storage ring. Right? An important factor that you will see along my presentation is that all this technology and all the construction, it was done all with Brazilian technology and local industries. So all these magnets that you see, these magnets are used to, to make the electrons curve their trajectory into this orbit and also to produce the radiation, it's both, both things. So, and all this technology was produced in the country. I will highlight some of these uh, technologies as, as we go. So this is one of the technologies is done by this company, VAG. Here in Brazil is a company of motors and generators that uh, they developed with us all these magnets that we use in storage ring. So for a quick tour, I hope you can see the video as we go from the linear accelerator uh, those lights are just simulation. Hopefully you will not see those lights inside the storage ring. But uh, as we go inside the storage ring, as I said, the electrons make uh, uh, this several turns into this first accelerator, the booster, until they reach the three billion electron volts, three gig electron volts. So then they are transferred to this storage ring with all these thousands of packages and creating current by by the magnets, by creating radiation, by bending their trajectories. So uh, they propagate inside these vacuum tubes, the ultra high vacuum tubes, and generate radiation that is later on used in these experiments across the beam lines. So there are several these stations that use the radiation, they're called beam lines. So what you see now is the electrons follow the path through these magnets, but the radiation, the photons, like, like I showed you from up, uh, the photons coming into the station, so the photons go this way, and they go to the experimental stations. Some of the parameters of the machine probably is more for specialized audience, but uh, this is a 3GV machine. Uh, our maximum current, uh, we are going to reach 350 milliamps in the machine as uh, uh, the RF frequency that gives this two nanosecond between pulses is um, uh, and uh, we have the, the magnets that bend the trajectory. These are um, divided into high field bending magnets. Uh, this is a 3.2 Tesla magnet field, uh, which brings photons of up to the order of 20 kilo electron volts, so high energy photons, and low field dipoles that we use for ultraviolet in infrared radiation. So this covers the entire spectrum of what we can do with ele electromagnetic radiation from synchrotrons. So, um, what is so special about this, uh, this uh, electron beams that create this radiation? So if we remember these packages that I showed you, they are accelerated. Every particle that is accelerated produces, uh, uh, charged particles accelerated produces radiation. And um, I try to make a symbol here that all the electrons, when they are accelerated, they emit photons. So they, all these photons have a certain uh, wavefront that propagates. And all the properties of this wavefront are determined by the size of the electron beam. So the more you can squeeze the electron beam, the better the qualities of your um, radiation in the end of the experiment. So uh, in the past, we had the um, second generation storage rings where this transverse size was of the order of one millimeter. So this, uh, uh, with this, we couldn't extract too much, let's say, radiation that was coherent transversely, right? Because the source was, uh, even though one millimeter is small, the source is too large for extracting coherent fraction of the radiation. Right? 
Um, now, the third generation synchrotrons that operated from the 90s to, to, to recently, they, they have already made a jump on this transverse size to 100 microsaw, a tenth of the, the size of the second generation machines, like the UVX machine that we used to have here. Now, the new technology, the fourth generation machines, which we have three in the world only, these are most like about 40, 50 machines in the world. Uh, there, uh, uh, in total of second and third generation. Um, there are several machines in second generation. Uh, third generation, we probably have of the order of 20, uh, have encountered recently. Fourth generation, there are only three. Uh, so Max 4 in Sweden, ESRF in, 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 in Grenoble in France, and CDUs here in Campinas. So most sources, all the sources, they have some fraction of coherence, of course. Any source of electromagnetic radiation, you can extract, if you put a pinhole, you can extract some fraction of the wavefront that is transversely coherent. But that's a small fraction, typically. This fraction depends, basically, on the ratio between the wavelength and the size of the source. So the smaller the size, the more coherent is the radiation for a given wavelength. So if you want to extract coherent, transversely coherent X-rays, you better have a source that is few microns only wide. So that's the key point for uh, these new synchrotrons. They are able to extract more coherent radiation for the experiments. This allows to access uh, the phase of the radiation as an information from the experiment. So if you think about, uh, let's say, telecommunications, in the past, before the 2000, before 2005 or so, I don't remember correctly, but uh, most of the information that was uh, was transiting toward in, in our lives through our phone and to fiber optics and to um, all communication systems, they codified information in the amplitude and in the frequency. Uh, as uh, you know, the, the physics evolved and, and telecommunications were able to use the phase content in the, uh, in the, in the, of the wave. And that amplified a lot the amount of information you could extract from your communications through op optical fibers. So that's the basis of our, your Wi-Fi for most of the technology that we use. It encodes the information on the phase, but we need coherence to do that, right? So the same kind of, of, of uh, revolution is going to happen now because now we can use also the phase of the X-rays to extract information from the samples. It carries all this information, but you need this phase coherence to extract information. So things like coherent diffraction imaging, imaging without lenses, or photon correlation spectroscopy, which is basically a, the uh, uh, dynamic light scattering that you use in, your, in some labs, but with X-rays, or even nanoprobe systems, because since the size, the so size of the source is small, and you typically can mag demagnify by a thousand factor. So if you have something of the order of microns here, you can reach something of the order of few nanometers. So you can focus your X-rays in nanometer particles and make the fraction in a single particle with nanometer size. For that, you need a small source. So you need this new generation of storage rings. Or even if you want to submit your samples to extreme conditions and analyze new phases of matter, typically these extreme conditions are only reached into a small volumes of sample because you have to penetrate very extreme environments. So you need the small beams with a small divergence. So these are the scientific reasons why you need uh, to use uh, this fourth generation synchrotrons. Now, excuse me. This isn't, uh, yes. Excuse, what, what kind of materials do you use for lensing X-rays? Uh, very interesting question. Typically, you can you you have to use very low Z uh, materials because they have to transmit. We don't necessarily need to use lenses. Yeah, I hear you, I, 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 I symbolized a lens. You can use lenses. We typically rely on curved mirrors most of the time. We are going to use lenses also, but like a general optics, you, uh, 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 you can use lenses, you can use refractive lenses, you can use diffractive lenses, uh, you can use um, curved mirrors for, for focusing. Curved mirrors have an advantage because they are achromatic. The focus is achromatic, doesn't depend on the wavelength. Now, lenses, since the refraction index depend on the wavelength, even for X-rays, then you have a focus that depends on the energy. So for spectroscopy, this is uh, not as, uh, as good as keeping your uh, focal point in the same position as you scan the energy. But it has some advantages. Lenses are much simpler to deal. 
but typically you, it requires a very light material like beryllium, like aluminum, it can be of silicon, right? But beryllium lenses are very popular because of the, 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 of the, the low Z, but they are tough to, to manufacture. Now, refracting mirror, the uh, mirrors, um, they use total external reflection. Uh, as you may not know or not, um, in the X-rays region, uh, the refraction index is slightly smaller than one you know, of, uh, of denser materials instead of higher. So you can use the phenomenon of uh, total uh, reflection, uh, like you see in the water from going from dense, uh, from water to outside, you have total reflection. In the X-rays, you can total reflect from a flat surface of silicon, for instance, a polished silicon. So that helps a lot. That was, that's, a, that's a phenomenon actually was discovered by Einstein uh, that uh, the, 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 the refraction index of X-rays should be smaller than one. We totally rely on this phenomenon, even for refractive lenses as well, because uh, in X-rays, the lenses are empty spaces. So if you do a beryllium lens, a converging beryllium lens has to be the opposite, the, the other way around. It's something that has a, an opening in the form of a convergent lens that you, you, you would use in the visible region. Uh, that's a good question. So yes, this all this optics uh, follows, uh, I have oversimplified this optics now, but you need some elements that will select the wavelength of the radiation and you need elements like lenses or mirrors that will focus. And then you need something to put your sample in or extreme conditions or in a, a kind of environment. So, and um, this, this entire thing that is easy, we call it beamline. Right? It's a very simplified version, but it's this full extension. This is the longest beam line we have. This is 150 meters long. So it's, a, it's a, in a very simplified way. That's what I showed you. But along this path, we have X-rays coming all the way from the synchrotron. And then we have curved mirrors over here into this building. I'm, I'm going to show you now uh, an example of this. So we will, you will walk with me. Uh, uh, we will pass through this hutch here. And then we go all the way to this pipe, to the experimental station where the X-rays are focused. So. Um, uh, and this is what we call beamline. So you have some hutches that carry this uh, optical elements. Uh, in the end, you need a very complicated apparatus to hold the pieces of silicon and, and very stable or pieces of uh, uh, polished mirror or lenses uh, and your sample. But it has to be all uh, with controlled environment. It has to be with uh, controlled temperature, controlled humidity. It's a clean room for that you use for electronics, but with the very thick walls of steel because you, you cannot lead, let the radiation outside from the, the from this with the, from this area so this is a walk-in area so you need uh, this what we call hutches these are also produced here in the country we developed uh, this is a compli relatively complicated uh, house made of steel and a clean room made of steel and we needed several of them so we had to develop this and uh, now we have providers that are selling for us and for other places uh, so this is a small tour that you will see of that beam line that I just showed you. So we are seeing the first hutch here, right? And that long path, the X-ray goes through this long path. So we will walk with me. We're inside the building now, as you just, the one that I just showed you, this, uh, this animation where the photons are coming. Now several control systems, liquid nitrogen to cool the optics because it's required. There's a high, high, pot, uh, high low. And this is where we come to where the sample is. Okay, so now we are, you are looking closely. Yes, the um, mirrors are, uh, that focus the radiation are behind this, this part, this black part here. So it focused the X-rays here in this region. These are all detectors. I'm going to show some of the results that we think that you can do and give you some more details. But this is the end of the line where the X-rays are focused and you, do your, you put your sample right in the beam. I'm going to show some, some details. But before I do that, let me give you an overview. So I showed you a tour in one beam line. That's what we plan for uh, until 2023. So the one that we just visited is called Carnauba. Yeah? All these beam lines, they are named after trees or animals from the Brazilian flora and fauna. But they are also acronyms for the techniques. For instance, Carnauba is coherent, nanofocus beam line, KTDT is another one that we are going to show some results, a coherent time resolved scattering, and so on. So these are the plans that we have with different techniques. I'm going to give an overview of what they do, imaging, 
diffraction, scattering, spectroscopy, different beam lines. Currently, we are uh, assembling nine of these beam lines, um, um, most of the ones that are here in these extensions, and uh, we, which are in different stages of their installation. So some of them uh, are already with users operating. Some of them are in the early stages of construction. And we plan to start the construction of the others uh, in, as, uh, well, in the next months. So they will always, uh, Rodrigo, when you ask me, uh, is it ready? So some of these beam lines, the accelerator, of course, is ready. There are things to be done yet to upgrade, to increase the current, to increase stability, but it's operational. And some of these beam lines are operational, others are in construction. So uh, people typically ask, so when is it finished? Well, never. Uh, in principle, we can install 40 beam lines in the storage wing. And each one of them will serve different purposes, different kinds of experiments. I will try to outline some of these experiments. So this was, um, uh, I showed you the, uh, the, 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 the construction phase, then we had the installation phase of the accelerators. And by December, 2019, we had the first uh, stored beam and the first image. Uh, I will show some of these images of the tomography beam line. Then February, we were managed to increase the current. Here's uh, we always measure this current in milliamps. And but we, as as everyone, we had to halt by the pandemic. By pandemic. And by April, we had to return with 10% of the site, mostly to have people that could finish some of the installations so that the others could work remotely on finishing the installation and continue their work. And uh, with a bit of effort, then uh, by June last year, we started commissioning the protein crystallography beamline, Manaka. Uh, by July, we started to uh, commission the coherent uh, the imaging beamline. And then current reached 40 milliamps. And then we had other two beamlines in operation. By the early this year, we had to realign, actually, to do the first fine alignment of the, the magnets of the machine. And by April, we reached the current that we are, we are now at 70 milliamps. And we have more or less 30% of the stuff on site. Uh, we are still not back to normal yet, uh, following restrictions of how many people can occupy rooms and, uh, and masks and all this, uh, all this required by, by, by the sanitary authorities. Um, but we, we are being able to move on uh, as, as we can, and uh, uh, I'll show some of the recent results. So let me start by typically uh, show this slide after showing some uh, of the, uh, you know, elementary fields of nature, quarks, leptons, uh, and gauge bosons, and all the stuff that uh, nature is made of that you find in particle accelerators. Uh, in synchrotrons, you are able to do something similar, but with quasi-particles. Uh, we can probe quasi-particles with different techniques, like angle resolve photoemission is one of the techniques that will be available, or uh, resonant inelastic X-ray scattering, where we can see excitations like uh, spinons and holons. And for those that work in condensed matter physics, this is very exciting. Uh, also, uh, angle resolve photoemission to look at uh, um, different kinds of, of quasi-particles that have properties that are foreseen maybe in high energy physics like Majorana fermions, but they can be measured as excitations of condensed matter. So um, for this area of condensed matter, uh, we have basically uh, one beam line that's dedicated to extreme conditions. So uh, essentially you can look at the materials from using diffraction and spectroscopy uh, different techniques uh, with a range of pressures um, up to terapascals and uh, the range of magnetic fields up to 10 Tesla and uh, temperatures from Kelvin to kilokelvin, let's say 1000 of Kelvin, sub Kelvin to 1000 of Kelvin. And with those conditions, you can probe different states, uh, new states of matter. We have a lab for preparing this extreme conditions. Uh, that is also you open for the for the community. Uh, this these systems are in commissioning, so it means we are doing experiments in them. They are not open yet for for the community because first because we are uh, they are not finally tuned yet, and second because we cannot uh, receive generally users in the facility. 
Uh, but this will be finally complemented to once we define thermodynamics, some different uh, thermodynamic states of matter, uh, we'll have uh, uh, Sabia is one of the beam lines in construction that allows you to do spatial and energy resolved magnetization. So it's a big magnetometer using uh, X-ray uh, magnetic circular dichroism. So basically you use X-rays to probe magnetization of materials, or you can image uh, photoelectrons um, uh, and the, also uh, probe the, spatially the magnetization of materials. Now, with angle resolved photoemission is one of the beam lines that we will start constructing now. We have actually started uh, uh, is an angle resolved photoemission uh, that will work with uh, two milliliter volt energy resolution and with spots of, of order of 10 microns. So it's uh, uh, basically dedicated to uh, measuring the electronic band structure of uh, condensed matter systems. Um, then this will be complemented by a beam line that is already uh, assembled, is in the final stages now uh, to begin commissioning, uh, that uh, has a nice instrument for resonant inelastic X-ray scattering with uh, basically you can look, instead of the single electron uh, um, excitations, you can use that look at collective excitations of condensed matter like those spinons and hollow and measure their dispersion relation. And um, this beam line also has a, a, an, an X-ray for photoemission spectroscopy uh, uh, general, for general use, but mostly is going to be dedicated to resonant inelastic X-ray scattering. And finally, we can uh, use, uh, this is also facility in commissioning, so it's, it's working, they're doing experiments for in situ growth. It's a lab that can grow samples for all these different kinds of experiments. So in a sense, uh, we can help the community, scientific community, not only to bring their samples uh, to the facility, but also to grow their samples with good ideas. Of, of course, this is limited to some of the elements that you can grow in the lab, but uh, we plan to expand as we go to provide this as a service. Uh, these are first, very first uh, results that we had recently from doing high pressure experiments uh, um, um, high pressure exper experiments uh, in condensed matter. So uh, you can see in this compound, uh, they basically should have a phase transition as a function of temperature. And they were able to see this uh, through the fraction. This is not really yet, uh, it's an unpublished result. It's mostly to see that we can do the fraction under high pressure conditions. And very soon we'll be able to bring uh, samples from the community to start and later on to open this. This, 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 this system. So basically with that, um, I covered, you can measure simultaneously, uh, not only the fraction, but uh, Raman spectroscopy and all in the same instrument simultaneously. This will be available uh, very soon for the community. Now this is I covered the condensed matter physics area. Now the, for the soft matter and biology, we do have beam lines dedicated to different, like for 3D structure of cells, or for small angle scattering, and this is one of the beam lines in construction, uh, or for infrared spectroscopy with nano and micro spectroscopy with infrared. This is the Imbuya beam line. This is already in commissioning. Uh, the sec basically also completing this, uh, these tools for measuring this, the, the structural biology all from the molecule all the way to the cell. Uh, we basically then have the Manaka beam line that is a protein crystallography. This is already. Uh, with uh, several users. We even have the first paper from the community published uh, using results from this beamline and the um, uh, UV spectroscopy using the, the uh, dichroism. Uh, all of that uh, has uh, an, an idea that you can basically join all this data for structural biology. And our dream is then in the future, we can, this can be used as uh, basic building blocks for we under, so that we can understand cells uh, from basic block building blocks and how they organize and how they interact. And uh, this is a very hopeful future for structural biology. This is a, a, an image produced by, by, the, uh, by David Goodsell and collaborators using structural data from other synchrotrons and electron microscopes, but basically composing this all with uh, uh, computer simulations. The most real model you can have using building blocks from measured from synchrotrons and electron microscopes. Uh, this was the first structure determined in the protein crystallography beamline. Later on, we had the first users 
and uh, they were able to study um, different kinds of coupling between molecules and proteins. And, um, and recently we had the first paper where they look at snapshots of, uh, uh, of, of a protein interacting, uh, do, doing its maturation process uh, and is related to, 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 to the SARS-CoV virus. In fact, this beam line was the first one to be open because it was um, part of a strategy to help the community on their research uh, uh, for, um, uh, against the, the, the coronavirus. So this was the very first experiment that we opened because of the emergency causes. And, and we are seeing already results. There are tens of structures that are, have been already deposited in the protein data bank. So the community is using this facility more regularly and we hope as the pandemic mix uh, is over, then we will have more users also. Uh, the Katere Tebing line, the one I showed you that we'll be able to do, um, uh, in fact, is doing already, but it's, it's a diffraction imaging beam line. So it's in a sense similar, you also measure the fraction, but in a much smaller angle, the detector is not in the air, but is inside this big vacuum tube that has 30 meters, is a 30 meters long tube. Uh, if you look inside the tube, this is where we have the detector. This the X-ray detector was developed also here in the country uh, by a Brazilian company that is now commercializing. This is a very interesting system for for laboratories, uh, for regular diffraction or for imaging. Um, and we use uh, in all our beam lines on, on Sirius. So what you see here is how the experiment goes. So this is a, a cooling system. The beam comes from here. This is a silicon nitrate a membrane where the sample is. And um, these are the first tests we did, we did with uh, uh, zeolite micro uh, cubes. And um, we measured this diffraction pattern. So this is what you get from this big detector area, the X-rays transverse the sample, they pass through the transmit through the sample, they come from here and they, the detector is now very close to the sample, but when it stays all the way there on the end of the tube, then you see that this, this pattern that we call speckle pattern, which is nothing but interference of X-rays, coherent X-rays going through the sample and inter interfering and giving this nice imaging, which is just an interference pattern. Now, as I promised you with uh, this information about the phase, we can then extract information about the structure of this, uh, this materials with a resolution that depends only on the size of the detector. So it's image without lenses. And the resolution of image is basically depends on how far we actually probing the image in the Fourier space. So the larger the detector, the more, the higher is the Fourier component we're probing, the higher is the resolution of your, 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 of your image. These detectors can do up to a thousand frames per second at uh, 24 bits of, uh, of, of depth. And uh, this is one of the first 3D images that we got. So it's basically this, this is to show that from uh, the same kind of sample in the electron microscope, now we see in 3D uh, the, the, the interior of this, the samples uh, that the, the X-rays can penetrate and make the images. So this is still in commissioning mode, but it's already showing very interesting results using the coherence of Sirius. The last scientific area that I'm going to show, so I showed you condensed matter, biological soft matter, now applications on what we call heterogeneous hierarchical matter. So basically partly inorganic, partially organic uh, matter, which is, uh, you know, soil, for instance, I give you a, some examples of the soil or catalysts. Uh, so we have different kinds of uh, beam lines. Uh, some of them be dedicated in different levels of image. So to start with uh, X-ray microtomography with high energy beam. So you can measure it is the first beam line to get some results. So you can do 3D images of porous structures like um, rocks from, uh, from uh, full of oil or uh, soil samples. And then you can use Karnaúba beam line, the one that we visit through the tour, the first beam line to do nanochemical and crystallographical mapping with a nano beam or a PDF uh, to look at the atomic structure of uh, partially crystalline or disordered materials. Or even for highly crystalline materials, we can use Pineda, which is a crystallography beam line, high throughput crystallography, and is being assembled as well. And X-ray spectroscopy on the quark T beam line, where you can look down the way down to electrons and how the chemical bonds are formed. 
So different length scales, different time scales, probe the entire heterogeneous uh, matter. And again, the general idea is to find how the basic building blocks differently from condensed matter, differently from biology. Uh, here, our basic building blocks are larger, are more complex because they involve living organisms, communication, uh, inorganic matter, dead matter, bacteria, fungi, uh, fluids with different ions. All of this complexity is what gives birth to life, as we know. And uh, understanding better these systems will lead us to uh, uh, prepare for the future. So uh, the secret of carbon, uh, of climate change, probably relies also a lot on the soil. How much carbon can we put in the soil? This is a very important question. How much the soil uh, holds of, uh, and fixates carbon? How do we take phosphor from the soil to continue planting and generating food? Phosphor is a resource that is, it's, it's, it's soon going to be over. So all these questions have to be understood in the microscopic level because we don't know yet how carbon is fixated essentially uh, into the soil, uh, how is phosphor fixated into the soil. So having this nano imaging tools that can probe uh, chemical uh, states and crystallographic state will be crucial in the future. These are some images of, the, uh, the, the, of this beamline, uh, the, the uh, X-ray tomography beamline. This is a very different kind. This is a, the, uh, a mouse heart. Uh, you can see some of the details of the heart, and uh, you can. We we have the, been developing also uh, compute computing techniques and tools with in collaboration with Nvidia for for extracting not only images but also quantitative data. This is a basically cell by cell identified in a heart and their orientation and how they are aggregating or doing the multi-label segmentation. Uh, this is a 4D image done in this uh, first version of the Mogno beamline. You can see it's a time-resolved tomography that we can follow. Uh, this was a simulation of um, an aquifer um, um, a re re recovery of an aquifer. So you, you basically simulate uh, uh, poisonous systems that are in the, uh, there are sticking to this uh, silica spheres. And then you use uh, fluid to try to remove uh, this, this, this in a simulation of what you would be also to think how you recover an aquifer that has been contaminated. So this allows us to see how the bubbles are formed, the reaction is formed in a model system. Of course, this is not the real aquifer, but that gives an idea how to upscale this kind of uh, technology. And also, as I promised in this, in, in, uh, for, for the soil, not only the soil, but how the soil interacts with the plant and their roots. This was one of the images during the commissioning of this tomography beamline uh, that was done. So you can see from here, this is data uh, from our commissioning also, where you can see the structure of the roots and their vessels and how they are connected to the soil and the fluids in the soil and their porosity. So all of this will help us understand in the future this what is called the rhizosphere that gives its, its entire ecosystem of microorganisms and fluids and inorganic systems and the plant. Uh, we've been preparing instruments for this kind of, uh, uh, of uh, measurement, specific for this kind of measurements where you can use plants. I'll give you some of these examples. Um, but for the case of the um, this beam line that I showed you in the very beginning, uh, this is the kind where we, we put the sample. Uh, these are the detectors. Um, and to give you an idea, this is where the X-ray is coming from. This is uh, the fluorescence is coming from. And uh, we can look at the fluorescence from point to point in this image and map, for instance, this is grass roots in the soil. So this is a kind of experiment that we can also do not only in tomography, but we can also do chemical analysis point by point of the matter around the root. Uh, not only for the root, but we are developing also microfluidic device, controlled atmosphere, electrochemistry, cryocooling. So all of the systems that can be coupled to this instrument to measure the beam in, in the beam lines. To summarize, uh, these beam lines will cover different uh, aspects from structural to electronic aspects of matter. 
So from the magnetic measurements, infrared, nano imaging, uh, covering living matter, quantum matter, from what I said, functional matter, from all these aspects, or beam lines dedicated to more like diffraction and scattering, covering different spatial information from small angle scattering all the way to high resolution powder diffraction, or X-ray spectroscopy, infrared, or ultraviolet, or um, soft X-ray spectroscopy. So to summarize, these are basically cover the beam lines that we'll have available in our synchrotron, covering all the spatial information in multiple length scales from five picometers, nanometers, micrometers, millimeters. And this whole suit of beam lines is going to be used to tackle problems in these different areas from biological, quantum, and functional materials. So uh, there are some developments, but I guess I'm already um, uh, crossing the, the time. So um, these are the labs that we have available for the users, computing infrastructure um, that uh, basically cluster systems and storage systems that can hold all this data. So typically users don't bring home their data, they, keep, they are stored here and they use, we provide the tools for data analysis. Some of the developments, uh, I think an important part of the project was that it was most of our purchases were done in the country through the development of these companies that did detectors, uh, vacuum systems, magnets, and so on. And um, to finish, so as I said, we had to adapt to this new reality, uh, but to, we, I think we managed to make good progress. Um, we are commission, commissioning something in the, the storage ring is almost finished, but it still needs work to be done. The beam lines are being commissioned as with the results that I showed you. It's a kind of uh, unusual since normally you have the machine finished and then you start the beam lines. We decide to move along with both things. It's been a very interesting uh, experience. We're close to the, um, to the nominal uh, parameters of this machine. So we are still evolving, but uh, um, we have several systems that were developed with local industries that are being in operational in beam lines. These are being used in our synchrotron and they will be available also for purchase by, by other uh, laboratories and, and universities. Um, uh, we are also installing and providing infrastructure for labs and for high performance computer. And um, very soon we expect to have at least four of our beam lines ready for use, the ones that I showed you here. With that, I, I'd like to thank you uh, for your attention and open for questions. Thank you very much for this presentation where you showed us this impressive enterprise in Brazil. So we have plenty of time for questions. Yes, Luis. Yes, uh, thanks a lot for the talk. It's really amazing to see uh, uh, all the things that you are doing there in Campinas. Uh, I'm, I'm really happy to see that it's uh, it's here, not not that far away. And uh, I, I'm very curious. With um, you, you commented that uh, you are building this Arpis line, and it's um, it, it looks uh, something very nice. I mean, uh, for people in condensed matter, many doing topological materials actually joke that. Uh, the whole field of topological materials would not exist if it were not for ARPES, and and somehow it's um, it has a lot of truth, and and so um, I, I wanted to ask, uh, when are you planning to have this line finished, and and how much does it cost to build such a thing? The, okay. This, this the, the line, in particular, the ARPES line. Okay. Um... So um, this beam line, in fact, it was supposed to be finished already. Uh, we, um, we, by the, uh, the early, the beginning of this year, uh, we were starting the construction of this beam line, but we had the uh, uh, budgetary restrictions in the country, while the country is currently not a very stable economic or in political situation. But um, uh, so we had to um, postpone the construction of this beam line. But we believe that now the situation is clear. So we will continue the installation. But for instance, the ARP spectrometer is, uh, we do have it already, is a spec, spec spectrometer with lenses, uh, a magnetic lenses analyzer. And uh, so it's a state of the art spectrometer. Uh, several of the optics uh, we do have already. So I believe uh, that um, 
if the cash flow permits in, uh, in the something of the order of six months, uh, we should have a, 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 a possibility to start commissioning this, this beam line. Now, beam lines have costs that uh, are completely different. Oh, by the way, the, yes, the topological uh, materials are, it's one of the key uh, scientific cases for, for this project. In fact, um, that connects very well with uh, uh, with uh, the extreme conditions beam line as well, because basically you can uh, let's say find out in the phase diagram where do you, you have a material that can is a candidate for topological for, for being a topological material, and then you can study its band structure by by ARPES or uh, or even RICS. I think RICS is going to be a very interesting technique, especially for um, for these materials. Now, uh, beam line cost. Typically, a very complex or well, an average beamline in the world, in other synchrotrons, it will cost about ten million dollars. That's roughly the cost of an instrument, a full instrument. Now they 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 they, they vary a lot because it depends on the source, depend on the energy range, depends on the kinds of detectors. They, so they can cost from, I would say, from two to twenty. Is a, it depends a lot on the kind. For the ARPES beamline, the beamline we are constructing now is a relatively inexpensive beamline because we are using uh, the, as source we use one of the band magnets. Uh, this wouldn't be possible in a regular synchrotron, but since the source of our band magnet is so small because of the fourth generation, and because the way we build the machine, uh, it gives a very competitive source for a, a relatively small price. So, and that saves a lot also in the uh, radiologic protection of the system, which is quite expensive. This, those hutches, they are, they are made of steel, they are quite expensive, but for the ARPES beam line, we don't need those. So all in all, this beam line, uh, uh, it, it's, it's one of the cheap, uh, I, I would say it's more in the cheap side, uh, in the cheaper side, uh, not an average cost. If you wanna build a beam line uh, more advanced, uh, then uh, yes, it, it may cost up the order of $10 million. Amazing, amazing, thanks a lot. Thanks. Uh, there's a question of Fernando Lu. Oh, thank you, Harry, for a fascinating talk and uh, congratulations on uh, your very significant achievements. I, I have a question. Uh, once most of the work in progress that you have described is completed, what will the main differences be apart from geography? And I am aware that geography is very significant difference. Well, on a more technical aspect, what will the main differences be between this machine and other light sources that are that have at present a lot of visibility, you know, like Grenoble or Brookhaven and the like? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, Brookhaven is a, a third generation machine. So um, uh, let's start from the ones that are more well known, let's say, um, you know, uh, either in France Soleil or Diamond Light Source or in the one in Brookhaven. Uh, the major difference is, as, as I showed in that slide, uh, effectively the beam size is smaller, so we can extract, you can condense your beam into the sample more easily with more flux. So, and with more coherence. So you can exploit different techniques that you don't have available in most synchrotrons. Now, uh, the, regarding the difference between the ESRF and the, the one in Grenoble and here, then we're, it's a different talk because both are fourth generation machines. Uh, the one in Grenoble has a much higher energy. So it's a 6 GeV machine. That means experiments uh, with, that require high brilliance in the higher energy X-rays, let's say 20, 30 KV, uh, they are much better done in this machine. In the soft to tender X-ray machines, uh, uh, region, then uh, machines like Sidious uh, are more competitive in this range. Then, uh, so that will be technically the major difference. But um, frankly, I think that uh, the jump from second generation to, to what we have now is enormous because most of the things that we wanted, like even ARPES was difficult to do in, the, in our old machine because uh, just to focus the beam, imagine we would focus the beam with hundreds of microns in the sample. So you have a sample that is a flake of something uniform, a few microns. 
you would lose most of your signal. So it, it, it's, it, it was very difficult to run experiments in protein crystallography from second generation to what we have now. From third generations to what we have now, there's a big jump. We can see already in the quality of the results that we are obtaining compared to protein crystallography and so on. Now, difference from this machine, fourth generation, the one in Max 4 and the one in Grenoble, I think it will be the science that will be done because technically now we are in the same order of magnitude. The, the major difference will be in the ideas of the scientists. Technically, we will have uh, very similar capabilities. Thank you. Um, yes, Victor. Yes, you mentioned that the beam size for photoelectron measurements would be about 10 micrometers, but is it for soft X-rays, for ultraviolet, is it the same all over the range? Uh, this beam line, the, uh, the, um, the ARPAS beam line is, is dedicated to ultraviolet. So we are this, uh, for this ARPAS experiment, is, uh, specifically, we are doing an ultraviolet ARPAS beam line, and this beam size is for ultraviolet. It's basically the fractional limit for, for what we have focusing uh, ultraviolets yes. in this range. Okay, um, and for, for X-ray, uh, about the one kilo electron volt, for example. Yeah, for, for X-rays, uh, uh, both Sabia and uh, Baby in line, they start at 100 electron volts, so the beginning of soft X rays, and they go up to two kilo electron volts. So, yeah, we, we cover part of the ultraviolet for condensed matter and part of the soft X ray region also. And the hard X ray, then it's in the Emma beam line. But I, uh, yeah, maybe we are covering basically the entire spectrum with different techniques. Technically, we can bring the ARPA spectrometer also to the soft X ray. Um, beam line to do the experiments. We, uh, we have done that in the past, but uh, as you know, then the resolution, uh, uh, although we can cover several billion zones and, and it's interesting, but uh, then you suffer a little bit from the, resolu the, the resolution and the angle result for the mission. So the, this, this time, I think our option was to um, aim in the high resolution, yeah. All right, I have a second question. Okay. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. You also mentioned uh -huh. that you have a growth facility. Can you grow oxide, particularly uh -huh. single crystalline oxide? Sorry, I, I, I think I was disconnected for a couple of seconds, so I didn't oh, hear your yes. beginning of the I, questions. I was asking because of the growth facility you showed. Uh, later. Uh, are you uh -huh. able to grow oxides, and particularly single crystalline oxides, and so? Yes, I, I will refer uh, to the experts for your question. I can give you the uh, uh, Pedro Esquiu. Uh, you can look at our website and uh, uh, S C H I O is his last name. Pedro, uh, he's the responsible for this lab. So I should refer to the experts uh, to give you an idea of what you can grow. Yes, I, I'm pretty sure you can, but uh, you, you should discuss with him the details of of what you specifically need. I believe the, it, it would be possible. If not, we'll find a way. Yes, and the last one, what happened with the old facility that I visited several, several years ago? Was it disassembled completely wrapped out of the map? Yeah, uh, it's oh, um, terrible. It's, uh, it was not is assembled completely yet, but we are finishing this this this, this assembly now. It's uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it, uh, we have debated for for quite a long time to how the, if we should keep it operational, but um, it's costly. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, it's a very high cost to keep a, an old machine operational as uh, well. And when you have an infrastructure uh, infrastructure new that uh, and the uh, the operational cost and the staff need. And um, in the end, it, it doesn't pay off to keep an old machine functional. So now mm -hmm. it's being disassembled completely. Right. Um, is there another question? Uh, I have one. When you showed this for the images, the time result three-dimensional images, how fast can, can you do that? That's an excellent question. 
Um, so, um, supposing that you what you're doing as a high resolution tomography uh, from different criteria is required that you um, have of the order of a thousand frames to to be able to do a thousand projections to do a nice three D image. You can do with less, but let's suppose that you're still using the uh, the so called crowd or criteria can run at a thousand frames per second. So if you use like a thousand frames for a single 3D image, that would be in the range of order of one tomography per second. Now, if you do last uh, frames, uh, uh, last projections, and uh, you don't require it to high resolution, then you might increase your, uh, your time resolution. So this, um, but uh, yeah, that will depend case to case. Uh, uh, this time resolution for 4D, I think it will be in the range of uh, seconds or if not a little below that. There is um, for 2D images, then you are mostly uh, restricted to the time frame of your detector, which is again, kilohertz that we're talking about. If it's 2D, like say photon correlation spectroscopy, uh, that will be the time range. Yes, and then for, for this fluid dynamics, case, typically you don't have processes that are much faster than one second. Oh, yeah. Or, that, you, no, you, were, or you were uh, using this, a high viscous fluid, something like this, too many. Well, typically uh, what you're looking at um, you, um, is uh, fluid injection, right? So there are, let me give you a case, uh, when you have um, states of uh, near capillary equilibrium, right? And then you have jumps. Uh, of pore filling jumps, so-called uh, highness jumps. And uh, with th those events, you cannot see them uh, as they happen, but as you pressurize the fluid, they will fill more pores. And then you see the snapshot of the next one and so on and so forth. So these are not, uh, let's say, um, you can be near equilibrium fluid dynamics, but it's not the kind of fluid dynamics that would, you would look at uh, the molecule motion. It's mostly, um, snapshots of event filling pore systems. But yeah, that, there's, there, there's a lot of uh, nice pore scale physics like uh, uh, that uh, in, in this area. Again, I'm, I'm, I should refer to the specialists, but uh, wetting angles uh, is, uh, and, and uh, pore filling events and uh, the dynamics of this uh, pore filling event especially how it connects to dissipation events, I think this is probably one of some of the uh, key uh, physical aspects for the future, this near or non-equilibrium uh, uh, filling events, of course, um, yeah. And there is also, uh, uh, I just, just mentioned one of the cases, but this beam line is also um, dedicated to um, in vivo measurements of animals so we can reach higher energies so um they also that um, we have a, an animal uh, um, facility here in the campus so we can study morphology changes and you can even synchronize the detector with uh, the ecgs of these animals and uh, this is a pro ongoing project it's not available yet but it's another aspect of, of time resolved tomography that we plan to use in the future and in this case, the events are repeatable, so you can you can you can kind of gate uh, and achieve higher resolution because it's very repeatable. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I don't know if there are further questions. Um, I I guess one uh, last uh, administrative question uh, that is: Do do you have a uh, space for interns in in the lab or? People just go to do experiments there only. No, no, actually, yeah, that, that's a good point to mention. Uh, we, um, I just mentioned this uh, serious project. I didn't mention all the programs that we have in the Senate payment, generally speaking. So we do have a, a training program that goes all the way from, like, say, um, internship students. Uh, the, we do have students of in master's degrees and PhD and postdocs. Um, uh, we now have um, 
we are starting uh, uh, um, science uh, bachelor course. Um, in uh, it's not going to be exactly here, but the, it's it's in a um, it's a faculty that is associated with a center, so that uh, you, you will be also provided uh, undergrad kind of, uh, of training for for some students. But um, mostly we do have training in this level of summer schools, uh, training schools. Like a few weeks ago, we did have uh, the uh, we have annually we have the Brazilian School of Synchrotron Radiation. Uh, it's actually called uh, Ricardo Rodrigues uh, uh, Synchrotron School in 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 homage uh, uh, to the um, uh, to Ricardo Rodrigues, who was the pioneer of this lab who was uh, basically the pioneer of synchrotron radiation in the country that left us um, <coughs> uh, last year. And um, we also have um, schools for uh, um, high school teachers uh, that we, uh, um, we present to them uh, the aspects of synchrotron radiation that can be later on taught in, in high schools level. Um, what else? And we do have training, more specific training schools for the techniques uh, in each one of these beam lines. So you can visit our website. To the, uh, we regularly we publish the schools that are open. We just had actually the Brazilian uh, School for Synchrotron Radiation a couple of weeks ago. Typically, these are two weeks school uh, with hands on. Unfortunately, now we don't have hands on, uh, uh, they're mostly work virtual. But hopefully next year they will, will start again to have hands-on school. Excellent. So, so please, if you have this information for next year, please send it to me so I can distribute it to, among the students. Yeah, we don't have yet the school for next year because it just finished. Yes, uh, uh, you, you can always visit our website, uh, www.lnls.br uh, or the CNPM, www.cnpem. Uh, dot br uh, where you will find the information about uh, opportunities also we are always have uh, open positions for scientists engineers uh, technicians and um, and student student scholarships postdocs um, uh, stay tuned <laughs> okay well uh, thank you very much Harry for this for this talk it was really really interesting and thank you everybody for attending this, the seminars of the physics department. And um, it was recorded, so it's going to be uploaded in the Facebook and YouTube site of the physics department. So thank you again. Thank you. Thanks. It was a pleasure. Bye-bye. 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 Take care.